I'll be doing announcements today as I have the name closest to Tyler. So Sunday school today, uh, the children up to fifth grade will be in the office with Marissa. Middle school children and up girls in the kitchen with Kay. Middle school and up boys in the trailer with Daryl. Uh, he says outdoors instead of the trailer. And adults will be here in the main auditorium with Merlin. Our upcoming events are October 19th at 10.30, Ladies Bible Study here at the church. October 23rd, Calvary Chapel Youth will meet here from 6 to 8 p.m. for food, fun, fellowship, games, Bible study, and music. October 26th at 8.30 a.m., Men's Breakfast and Building Maintenance Fellowship. October 27th, 11.15 a.m., potluck meal after the worship service, so no Sunday school. And 12.15 after that will be the Calvary Chapel board meeting. And on, also on October 27th at 4 p.m., the worship service for the residents at the Prairie Sunset Home. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be nice. All right, where's my kiddos? Oh, I guess he's getting it. Thanks. All right. What have we been studying? The fruits of the Spirit. Can we say what we know right now? Fruits of the Spirit are love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness. Ah, goodness, that's what we're going to learn today. Do you think goodness and kindness are the same thing? No. Somebody's shaking their head no. What's the difference between kindness and goodness? Can somebody tell me? Hmm. That's kind of right on the non button there a little bit. He's about right. But anyways, here's some, here's some de definitions of goodness. Is more than do, it's more than doing what's right. It's actively choosing to be kind, generous, and understanding towards others even when we don't have to. That's an interesting one. The next two is the ones I really like. Working for the benefit of others, not oneself. And the other one I like is sort of the same as the, this last one I said. Selfless care of others. So what do you think those last two definitions are saying? Um, help others be yeah, it's not about ourselves, is it? It's a really, truly deep within. Did you ever take a really deep breath in? All right, I want you to try that. Ready? Take a... Do you feel how... I mean, really, do you feel that pull in there? Let it out. We're supposed to feel goodness that deep with inside of ourselves. And the Bible talks about God being good and having God's goodness. I tried, I wanted to think about what Bible story could we talk about that would show goodness. And the first thing that came to my mind was the Good Samaritan. Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? What happened? There was a Jewish man, right, who was walking down the road, and what happened? Um, um, he got his somebody attacked him and beat him up pretty good, and stole his whatever he had, right? Um, and then, and then, and then other two people got and now looked at it and didn't help him. Uh, and then who came? Then the Good Samaritan. So there were men who walked by and left him on the side of the road for dead. 
And then the Good Samaritan. Now what's interesting about the Good Samaritan is that the Samaritan and the Jewish people didn't really care for each other. They had a lot of cultural clash and they weren't, they weren't very eager, the culture itself was, they weren't very eager to help one another. But this Good Samaritan saw this man along the side of the road, saw that he had been beaten, and he helped him. And it wasn't so much that he just helped him and said, okay, buddy, see ya. What did he do that extra for him? Does anybody remember? Yeah, he actually took, carried the man to an inn and gave the innkeeper money and to help him get better. And then he still did something really extra. What was that? Does anybody remember? Adults, can you help the kids out? Joe. Well, he said he'd be back to pay anything else that was in addition that he didn't already give. Wow. And their cultures didn't even like each other. And look what he did. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for the other man, no matter, even though he was a Jew. That's really a sign of goodness. It came deep from within his heart that the man needed help, and he went the extra mile, more than an extra mile, I would say, and he made sure that the man had everything he needed to get better. We should learn to practice that kind of goodness every day of our lives and do what is right, even when it's difficult to do. So I want you to try to remember that. Now, I gave you an assignment last week. How many of you remembered it? What did I tell you you were to do, go and do? Mm. Remember I told you to do some kind of kindness, act of kindness? Does anybody have anything to report that they gave an act of kindness? <gasps> Did we forget our assignment? Oh, you guys weren't here last week. All right, I forgive you for not doing your assignment. Yes. Ah. Well, way to go, Mr. David. All right, so this week you have a double assignment. Number one, you have to show a random act of kindness to someone. And the second one is do something out of the goodness of your heart and not expect anything in return. Got it? And then I'm going to check back with you next Sunday to see how you did. Well, then you can do another one. <laughs> okay, you can go back. <laughs> well, it is our privilege to gather this morning, and we want to thank you for coming. We also want to gather today and look at the Word, which we will in First John. And I noticed that uh, <clears throat> I had asked, let's try and read that about every day if you can. So um, let's just see how we did. Was there anyone who read it at least once this week? One hand, two hand, three hand, four hand, five hand, nice. Uh, twice, three times, four times, five times. Okay, this is where it gets shaky for me because sometimes I'm reading about the time I go to bed. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd say I'm coming down now. And six. Good job, Taylor. Thank you. Yeah. Now here's the bigger point, not the exercise. Taylor, just for fun, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. What are you noticing? How many really, really memorable lines there are in First John? My goodness, so many of the 
Parts of the lexicon of English language itself are found within this short book. God is love, for example. And he that knows not God, he that knows not love knows not God, because God is love. Something like that. It's fascinating. How many songs have you noticed that you knew growing up, probably? I've seen a few. I think six. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting how, very powerful book. We'll invite the praise team, come on up, <coughs> and encourage the rest of you to join us. Oh, we haven't done it yet? I'm sorry. Oh, let's do that. And I don't, I, and, and you'll do better not to have me up there. I'll fall down or something. Yes, thank you. Yeah. We need to get a few who know what they're doing. Oh, boy. You're braver than me. Here we go. You want to do it. can't be a fruit of the Spirit, because the fruit is love, joy, peace, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and love. Go up there. Go up there. Fruit, no, serious, not a banana. Spirit can't be a fruit of the spirit. Cause it's true. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh, fruit of the spirit is not a watermelon. 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 Don't hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit. Joy, peace, peace, gentleness, self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's not a lemon. 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 Can be a fruit of the spirit. Good spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Fruit's not there. It's not a cherry. Thank you, Deb, for that. <clears throat> we want to start off with just declaring some truth. We'll say what we believe is as you are a believer. <clears throat> Find your freedom in that, much like we just rehearsed the fruits of the Spirit. Let this be part of your declaration this morning. If you could stand, that'd be great. If it doesn't work for you, then don't worry about that. You can stay where you are. Express yourself before the Lord. Feel free to sing, and I encourage you to. Feel free to move in the way that you, you can honor Him. Let's sing together.
So we believe not in ourselves, that we're somehow enough, but we believe in Him. And when we come to that place, it won't be us deciding exactly what's going to happen. It'll be His Word. It'll be the Holy Spirit living within us. <coughs> so we <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> declare that we would follow Him, and not our way. Let's sing together, You Are My Vision.
will be a day beyond this earth where we will find ourselves not in toil, never in trouble, never in pain, never in sorrow. Let's think of that day. It's not out of reach for anyone. It's those who have trusted in Christ as their Savior. Let's sing together. talk about deliverance and not just the deliverance of those who have said his name but and trusted it for faith but also the deliverance of those who walk in faith let's sing together Couldn't stand to see my shame. 
Think of this week and times before it. Where is He your deliverer? It's not always just saving us from things. Sometimes it's saving us from ourselves, isn't it? So as we trust Him, as we submit to Him, as we take Him at His word and obey His word, we find that deliverance. Let's sing it again. Jesus, You are my deliverer. Dark to light, Jesus, you show me what. 
people that just just sin and disobey you you yourself required the penalty from sin and gave it yourself lord i pray these truths liberate us today and cause us to walk in freedom and grace and and find ways to serve you that we didn't know we were capable of we pray this in jesus name amen may be seated Today we'll be in 1 John chapter 2. So if you need a Bible, and you will, uh, we'll, they'll supply them for the back if you don't have one with you today. So if you'll access that, 1 John chapter 2. Now, John has written this letter to the church, and he has brought in many good truths here to them, and he's primarily writing to believers here. Uh, I think some might have been Gentiles, some may have been Jewish, but all the same, they are believers in Christ, as it's known. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no slave, there is no free. We are all in Christ. So I'd like to read the scripture today, 1 John 2.1. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth's not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way he walked. Let's pray. Father, we come to you with this verse, or collection of verses before us. Lord, I pray for realignment in our world, in our hearts and in our minds. I pray for freedom to be visited on those who will catch on to this teaching. I pray for an increase in building your kingdom because we find out how you love us and what you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. So the first verse was, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Let's stop there. And so he's not writing it to youth, necessarily. He's writing it to the believers, and he's calling them his children. John's not trying to be overly parental here. He's just saying, and it would be pretty much true that he or others had brought the gospel to them and are helping them grow. And so he referred to them as his little children. And he he writes these things so that they would not sin. What what, what things, John? Well, a lot of this. And he's going to be very uh, explanatory here in a moment. And you might be sitting here going, okay, you write this to me, John, to them and then to us, that I may not sin. All right, let's just hold that thought. I would say if you are perfectly without sin in your Christian walk, come see me and we'll trade places. Uh, This is an area, isn't it? This is a thing. Now, many of us, it's changed over the years, hasn't it? It's not that sin. It might be something different or something, I don't want to say less, but maybe less of an impact on the world around me and myself. But the idea is there is that struggle within the believer. Is it because sin's power was not broken at the cross? No, it was. Then what's the problem? We access it. 
and choose that. So John is going to help us here. And he's saying, hey, you're not to sin. Don't do that. But if you do, and here it is. But if anyone does sin, it means think, do, act, anything against God or His Word, which that could be a lot of things. There's a place in the Bible that says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Oh my. Things that weren't done in trust with the Lord for Him, that could even be sin. Now don't get overly nervous about that. Uh, you say, well, why not? Well, we're going to find out in a minute, but I'll, I'll, I've got to spill it now. It's too good of a truth. Believers, we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And as long as you're not quenching the Holy Spirit through your own indulgences and sin, or searing your conscience against the Holy Spirit like a scar develops because you just keep doing that thing, you can hear the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, what if I'm in those places? How do I get back? It's that simple. Just come before Him and say, God, search me. And I am denouncing and confessing these things are sin. And here I am. We're right there. All right, so let's continue here. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Not the first time John has used the word advocate. Uh, or excuse me, not the first time you've heard the word advocate. If you go to the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus using the term as well. But in this case, he's referring to Jesus himself as the advocate. And you say, well, what, what's the word? Okay, well, 1 John 1, 7, we're going to see what an advocate does. Now, Jesus is teaching, and he's letting these folks uh, know what's going to happen. And so he says, uh, he says, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood... Oh, oops, sorry. What, next week? Never, hang on. Okay, there we go. Uh, can, a vic, can a Christian have victory over sin? That's the question. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and look up through our Scriptures a little bit. The first place we're going to go is to the book of Romans. Now, this is not John writing this. This is Paul. Now, Paul was a religious man of the sect known as the Pharisees, and they were very religious and adherent to the law of God. But, Saul had got his own agenda and was failing to see what God was doing and had prophesied he was doing, and he was persecuting the church. But now, he's writing to the people at Rome, uh, the believers there, and he gives them some information that will help us today. Let's take a look. Romans 6, verse 12. Let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Folks, don't let these sins have control in your body. You say, well, what are they? Well, we can just start naming works of the flesh, and there's many. But I'm just asking without any um, condemnation here for you to take that assessment today of yourself. So think about it. Is there any sin reigning in your body? Is it? And it can be many things. It can be addiction to substances uh, or misuse of them. It can be lust. It can be desire in a way that's not good for you. It could be uh, gossip. It could be grumpiness as a lifestyle. Uh, not, not, not before coffee maybe. But uh, the idea, maybe it is. But all, all the same, we can... Let those things reign, as in rule, and we just kind of make it part of us. That's who I am. That should stop today. Not in some morbid way of just being so destroyed in our, our weaknesses. That's not what we're doing here. But notice what he said. Let not sin, therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You do not have to obey sin. I do not have to obey sin. That, was, that power was broken at the cross. And so if you were a believer, someone who has trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then that power is broken in you. Verse 13. Now, see this part. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. This is kind of graphic when you think about it. He's referring, I think, to parts of your body. Don't take your body and then 
can't detach things without lots of pain and trouble, but don't give your brain, your hand, your foot, or other parts of your bodies to be used for unrighteousness, our mouth. Just don't give away this parts of your body to be used for unrighteousness. But, here's the contrast, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members, your parts, to God as instruments of unrighteousness. Now, just see it in your mind. God, I'm coming to you as someone who is essentially spiritually dead. And now I believe what Christ has done. And I want to say, these things that, are, that I have control over, my members, I want you to take them and use them for righteousness. Whatever it is, eyes, mouth, brain, everything. Let's go to Colossians 3.3. 3. Now while you're going there, I'll finish this verse. For sin will have no dominion over you. Whoa, Paul, are you kidding me? Are you telling me that sin doesn't have to rule my life? I've struggled with this sin for 50 years, Paul. No. Paul's right. I've met with people and sat with them and, and, and in my own life at times thinking, how am I ever going to move past this? Sometimes it's, it's a, almost like a healing. And sometimes it's a process of taking every thought captive, exposing myself or this situation to others, saying, hey, I need you to help me here. Hold me accountable in this. Okay. All right, let's go on to Colossians 3.3. 3. All right, so we were as dead without Christ. We're sinners. Here's what Colossians 3.3 3 says. It, if then you have been raised with Christ, we're going to believe that to be true. If you are a believer in what Christ has done, who's paid your penalty, there's nothing going to save you but it, giving up and accepting that and letting him transform you, and he will. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek things that are above. Well, okay, what does that mean? Like I just go look at the sky all the time and wait for a resurrection or a revelation from him? Not necessarily. He's saying in life is how you value and choose what to do. Place that value on what God's doing. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He said, well, what, what, why would I worry about that all the time? Because that is the thing that says to the entire world and universe, sin has been broken at the cross. Christ has set down at the right hand of God. It is a done thing. That truth will set you free, and we can take that truth and set others free with it. So, so put your mind on things uh, above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. It's, now, let's not be silly about this. Okay, well, let's, okay. Um, I'm going to go put on just enough clothes. But I'll choose white. How about that? Some white kind of robe. And I'll just stand here waiting, thinking about things above. And Okay, that's silly. But it, if you think about it, we probably have that absolutely opposite many times in our lives. We're worried about this and that and this and that child and that parent and that brother and that sister and ourselves, our wife, our, all those things, our this, our that, our activities here, all that, and saying, is my mindset above on what God's doing and why I'm here and alive right now as a believer? Or am I just getting bound up in the things of this earth? Verse 3, he gives more explanation. You've died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. You think about it, believer. If you are truly a believer, think about this. The person of sin, the person that's the rebel against God, the person who deserves eternal punishment in myself, Daryl, that guy's dead. Now, can I go back to parts of that life and act like that? I can. I don't have to. But my life is hidden in Christ. And this isn't me trying to please Him enough to finally accept me. My life is hidden in Him. I'm going to keep going with Colossians there. Let's see, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, 
appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Number five, verse five. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly. Like, make it have no power or life. And he gives some examples. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality. Okay, so in America, in the 2020s, we have definitions that mean pretty much do what you want, with who you want, with what you want. Now, believers, let's be honest with ourselves. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that sex is a thing that is a wonderful bonding thing. The ultimate communication between a man and a woman, but it's only to be used in the context of marriage. And that's where it's best. And also children come from that. And it's wonderful. And it's taken as this special, special thing. And drugged through the muck and perverted and distorted and it's used for just personal appetite and passion. It's used for destruction. It's used for crime. It's used for everything uh, seemingly than what it was supposed to. But we know better than that. And that's why we don't have to tolerate that. You say, oh, we're a big meanie out on the corner screaming at people. That's not how we do that. One, we live it right. And two, we share the benefit of God's way. You say, well, why is His way better? He created us. He made everything, including sexual union. Next, broader category, impurity. And boy, is there plenty out there, isn't there? You say, oh, you're up there because you... You're the pastor. You're never, you never cross paths with any of those things. Are you kidding me? I'm not pure Amish yet. I still have a TV. <laughs> or anything else. That stuff pours in. And you have to be discerning. To be honest, the more, the more we see it, the easier it is to see it. So be very cautious. And then just a general term of passion, which could be for anything. Not just people. <laughs> Passion could be for an art that you like to pursue or some sort of activity or maybe just the uh, adulation that you would get from somebody by doing that activity in front of them or your children doing an activity in front of somebody. It just becomes a passion beyond what it should be. And then there's just the evil desire. I want better for me than you. And that's where covetousness says, I want your stuff. I wish you didn't have your stuff. When we're looking for things, stuff, and lifestyle, we don't have the altars of Baal and Molech and all those things to go necessarily go look at. But it's no different. We're just setting up an altar and saying, God, I'm going to worship this for a bit. He said, oh, how dare you say that to me? Really think about that. It's not untrue. Okay. So, turn from that. And let's move on. Uh, let's go, to, um, we're going to be heading back to 1 John if you'd like to go there. So you, now the question might come up. Okay, so you have a list. They're from Colossians. What, what is all the sin we need to avoid? Okay, I wrote a note to myself about that. If we need a list of things that are sin, right? So we don't do them. Uh, consider that you may not be walking in the Spirit Possibly ignoring God's commandments as stated in His Word. He has made it very clear how to live. And the good news is, we are not under the law where we have to go and once a year listen to the law being read to us as the Israelites should have been doing. No, we don't. He wrote it right here. It's in our heart. And as we follow Him and watch what will happen in this passage, that's how we know. Walking in the Spirit. You say, what does that mean? Walking under the control of the Holy Spirit. Submitting ourselves, saying, Lord, I want to listen to you today. I want to hear what you're doing. I want you to direct me. And whatever I do, would you please show me if there's something that's not pleasing to you? All right. Let's go to 1 John 2 1, just to remind you where I started and, and rabbit trailed out of there. My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Now, that's not a term we use a lot. Some know it. 
that says we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteousness. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Well, so the word advocate is used. John uh, heard it being used by Christ. Let's just go see how it's used, and then we'll see how it's applied in 1 John. So Jesus is using it slightly different, but it's okay. So Jesus heard, or excuse me, John heard Jesus use the term, and when he was doing it, he was referring to the Spirit, and he talked about that. And the term they used was parakletos. Uh, others might think of it as, I've heard someone say this, or read this, the family lawyer. <laughs> the guy you call. <laughs> okay, so we know, now let's not just reduce it to that. Jesus Christ is the advocate for you. He is the one who stands at the right hand of the Father is the symbol, excuse me, as the fact that He has died for your sin. And so when God judges sin, and He does, there is wrath against sin. There will be none coming to you, believer, because it's already been paid for. You have the advocate, the parakletos. And so this this term was used for someone you call to your side, or one who pleads another's case before a judge. I like that one. Jesus is my advocate. We sang that. Jesus, you are my deliverer. You're my advocate. You're the one who stands for me. It was also used as the Holy Spirit uh, back from Jesus. And he was using the term as well. You have one that will help you. And I think those, not to confuse what he's doing, but I think it's worthy of taking a look at that. And so the Holy Spirit was destined to take the place of Christ with the apostles after he ascended. And he was going to lead them to a deeper knowledge of the gospel truth and to give them divine strength. He needed to enable them to undergo trials and persecutions on behalf of the divine uh, kingdom. All right, so whether I wrote that or someone else is, that's just a brief explanation. John 14, 16, I'll just read it. We're in the gospel of John now. And Jesus says, I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. He's referring to the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 26, he says, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, oh, oh the helper is advocate, same term. Okay. Whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring you bring to you your remembrance all that I've said. Yes, it's true. He will. And he is the advocate. Uh, So when you see helper, the term is the parakletos, the advocate. John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And then continuing in John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the advocate, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. And so Christ made it very clear the Holy Spirit is an advocate to help them along the way, to teach them the comforter, all those things. Now, that also was used in a greater way in 1 John. Christ is your advocate. So, Christian, if you find yourself sinning, you know why you're not under the wrath of God? Because you have an advocate. Because Christ died in your place. Now, that obviously makes some think, well, we'll just do whatever we want. We'll get to that in a moment. I'm going to go to Hebrews 10.12 for a moment. And really look at what was done for you. And we studied this some months back. But Hebrews 10.12. But when Christ had offered for all time. How many times? All time. How many sacrifices? Single sacrifice. Not blood of rams and goats and other things for years upon years. Those were acts of obedience and symbols to what was to come. No, it's happened. We look back to this. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice... 
for sins, all sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. He sat down at the right hand of God and he's the who? Your advocate. Get it? He's there for you. It's a done deal. So moving on here. Uh, let's go back to 1 John 2.2 2, if we could. Now we're going to use a word called propitiation. If you want to have work out your mouth a little, say it now. Propitiation. Propitiate. We don't say that a lot, do we? Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a very special word in the English language generally. But 2.2, uh, two, two, he, meaning Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, first of all, let's get past that. Let's get that word propitiation figured out. Another word that would work and was used in the Old Testament as the, a symbol of the propitiation was atonement. This word propitiation is an appeasement. How about this? It satisfies God's wrath. You understand sin is still sin, right? Believer or unbeliever. And there is judgment upon sin. But Christ has taken all of that judgment for you. You say, well, Darrell, we know this stuff. Why, why are you doing this? What's the point? I'm asking you, are you able to communicate that truth to coworkers, family, others, and, make, and to help them understand? It's not about religion. It's not about culture of religion. It's about an advocate. And it's about one, even if as a believer I sin, the advocate has already paid for that sin. And then he goes on in verse 2, the second half, he says, but also for the sins of the whole world. Be careful here. There is a thing called universalism. And so some might go there and say, well, if he died for sin, as you've said, and said over and over, well, then he's died for every sin. That is true. And that means everyone won't suffer any wrath of God. For well, that's not true. The Bible says, is appointed unto man, mankind, wants to die, and then the judgment. Yeah, there will be a reckoning. My reckoning, mercifully, was taken by Christ, and that's where my faith is placed in that. So the advocate, Jesus, the, the propitiation, meaning the atonement or the satisfying of God's wrath, that's what he's done towards our sin. And now you're thinking, I have an, a question then. If you I sin as a believer have been covered, you said past, present, future, I have an advocate. I'm saved from God's wrath. Well, the obvious question, right? Why don't we just go out and sin then and do whatever we want? Okay, let's go to Romans 6 1. Shall we go there? Many of you hear this verse from me regularly because this is the one that makes the sense for me. Because people will bring that as an accusation. Hey, 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 no way. What you, no, you can't have an advocate that's paid for all your sin. No, no. You've got to go back and ask each individual one because if you don't, then there's wrath waiting for you, meaning you could be judged. And what if you died before you got judged? And all these things, no, he's paid for it all. And that's why I can approach him boldly because I'm seen right through his sacrifice for me. And so Paul made it clear. He said, what shall we say then in Romans 6.1? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Yes, you and I are living under grace. I could be a turkey, whatever that sin would be. And yes, I am not going to be judged eternally for it. Because Christ paid for that sin. Now, does that mean I use that as license? Going, ha ha, I'll just do whatever I want. How many have tried living that in your life? Don't raise any hands. Okay. <laughs> I will. What a miserable existence that is. Horrible way to live. Grieved in the spirit. Ruining your testimony. Why, why do that? Right, and so uh, Paul did answer the question if you're wondering. By no means! How can we who died to sin still live in it? We're not supposed to. You say, oh, so I'm not ever supposed to sin? I think we know we do. The idea is, I'm not, we're not to say, well, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what the culture teaches me, I'm just going to do it, I don't care what God says. I don't care what the Holy Spirit is sharing, or even if you, if you can still hear it because of your callousness. That's not how we're supposed to live. 
Let's go to John, 1 John 1, 3. He said, we looked at that a few weeks ago. I, we did. Let's take a look at it now. John lays this out. Now, I'm not here trying to somehow put a star on someone who's a believer and a, some, an X on someone who's not. But there are things that you can notice. John 1, 3. And by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Walking with the Lord is an obvious um, symbol or a, a sign that you do believe. Okay. Occasionally, you'll meet someone. Oh yeah, I know about God. I, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're good old buddies. There's nothing in your life that would say that. Kay and I were sharing with a guy many years ago, a rough old fella, and I'm sure not a believer. Help me out, Ollie. Annie. He was saying, well, there will be a day and I'll meet God face to face. Now I'm going to have a few things to say about it. Like, oh no, you have no idea. And it was, it, was, it was just tragic to think that he would go to the living God and make his case known and probably sound like a little bit of accusing of God in some fashion. Oh no, no. And so I think it stands. John's right. By this we know that we have to, that we come to him to know him if we keep his commandments. Okay, let's roll back to Romans. I hope someone put a, a, a bookmark in. If not, the guys will take care of you. <coughs> Paul asks this question. Do y'all not know, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, baptism is an important thing. It's the evidence of what you believe. I think we can use it even greater here as in immersed into Christ, right? We are as good as dead because that old person is gone. He said, now listen, if that's what's happened, next slide please, we're buried therefore with Him by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You said, is he talking about heaven? No. He's talking about now. Oh, it's true. That is an amazing thing to watch when people who have accepted Christ or who decide to walk with Him. And you meet, meet these young Christians and man, they are on fire and I hope they never change. Or you meet someone who can spout all the truths, but they're just getting by, doing their thing as long as they can. That's it. No, no. It's a new life. So let's continue here as we go back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. And we'll start finishing up here. John makes it very clear. Whoever says, I know him, but does not com keep his commandments. All right, we meet those people. Oh yeah, I know God. Do you follow what he says? Well, no, I, I kind of do my thing. All right. John says, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. You don't know him. And truth's not in you. Truth would not be in him. Verse 5. Because here's what John knows. He knows this through the Holy Spirit. He watched it in Christ. But whoever keeps his word in him truly the love of God is perfected, completed, if you will. That's how God works for us. Those who know his word and keep it. And first of all, if you're walking with the Lord as a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. And so you'll know when you're doing wrong. By this we may know that we are in him. Verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. He said, well, how in the world am I going to walk like Jesus? Well, I don't think that's what it's saying. It's saying, are you walking, seeking God's favor above all things, and, or His will, or are you just existing? 
All right, so I wrote a few notes to myself here. One of the things I want to see happen today for some, if this is needed, is freedom. And let me just give some of my own thoughts based on my own struggle. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That is in Scripture. He is the one to say, in your thoughts, or however he does that, you're not good enough. This sin tastes better than God says it is. Man, he's been bringing out all that nonsense since Genesis 3, right? Oh, no, you won't die. Go ahead and eat the forbidden fruit. No, no. He, he loves to play that game. Now, I don't know how all his system works, whether they're putting those thoughts towards us or whether they're allowing the system of media. I, it doesn't matter. But he loves to entice and then accuse. Get it? And then, after he's done accusing, he's a very poor counselor. What? Why would we take the counsel of the devil? Listen, check it out. So, believer, you fall into something. And there's sin there. The first thing we should do is, right to the cross, God, I confess what I have done. I agree with you, as Scripture says. Where our fellowship is perfectly restored. Was our salvation in jeopardy? No. But our fellowship with Him is now. Here's what Satan wants. See if you can resonate with this. Yeah, you've sinned. And you're bad. Very bad. I'm not even sure if you could even be a believer if you do a thing like that. He's such a poor counselor. Because then he'll take that stick of understanding. Ha, ha. You're bad. You're so bad. Just quit trying to serve Him. Look at you. Which usually, if we listen to that, drives us back to more sin. And then eventually, he can give the stick of that accusing. Mm. Hand it to one of us, and we'll just beat ourselves. And he walks away giggling and laughing. Terrible counsel. No. You don't have to punish yourself for your sin. Christ died for all of it. You don't have to stay in it because of what it's doing to you. Those who are addicted to a substance, you know you don't need to stay there. Those who are caught up in something, you do not have to stay there. You can be delivered. Christ has paid for that sin. Walk away from it. Don't let it destroy you and everything around you. I could not find uh, whoever this quote is aspired to. I just found it. I put it out, couldn't find it. So let's just go by it. Some of you are depressed by your struggle with sin. I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, we can be. I've had that problem to the point of just almost paralyzed in life. Just, just not good enough. Just not good enough. There's too many things. Uh, many things from the past that I'm not doing, but I'm, I just wasn't good enough then. Okay, Satan's doing a number. He'd be giving you very poor counsel at that point. Some of you are depressed by your struggle with sin. Now consider this. The fact that you have a struggle is evidence the Holy Spirit is motivating you to resist. Freedom, right? The fact that that thing that you're thinking about going home and doing today, that you know it isn't right, that is the beginning of a toehold of freedom. Because now the Holy Spirit's working in you. Right? Isn't that cool? The fact that you have a struggle is evidence the Holy Spirit is motivating you to resist. The world has no struggle. They just indulge. Right. And, or you play this game. Well, oh man, I've kind of taken a step towards that situation. I'm already mad or I'm already this, I'm already that. I know God forgives me. I'm just going to go for it. Well, yeah, He will. Doesn't mean there isn't damage and pain and hurt and certainly doesn't build His kingdom. He said, why do you talk about this stuff, Daryl, so accurately I think. And so descriptively, because you're hearing me and my struggle at times in my life. And I'm fighting freedom to move past that stuff and have found freedom. It's wonderful. And we'll, as the Holy Spirit reveals more, move past those things. <coughs> the fact you're struggling is evidence that the Holy Spirit is motivating you to resist. The world has no struggle. They just indulge. But you have a fight because the Spirit of God is still 
working in you. You get it? Believers. No matter where we are today, the Spirit is here and ready. Now, are you ready? You say, well, what do I do with that? Well, I think it was written well in Psalm 139, verse 23. Pray this, live this, say this, and our God is so faithful. Psalm 139.23 Search me. Search me, God, and know my heart or thoughts. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. If you think you've got this or that handled, how do you do when it, there's a test? See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Seth, do you, would you mind tossing that up? I know it'll take a second. <coughs> Let's look at that again. And there is even a, a small song I think you can find for that, uh, those who want to go looking for it. But what a freeing thing to have. To do as the psalmist said, search me, God, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I love that. Because God's grace is what leads us to repentance. Let's continue. So, to the one, listening here, listening somewhere else, who is struggling with abuse of, or misuse of substances, to the one who is struggling with impure thought, or worse yet, impure action, to the one who has anger that is just like a volcano, barely corked, and spewing lava, lava every, now on people, every now and then on people, to the one who is so self-involved that they don't even have time for God's stuff, for the one who seeks the praise of mankind, for the one who is just grumpy and hard to live with, to the one who can't quite bring himself to see the full truth. To, and it's, this list can go on and on. To that one, realize there is hope for you. That you are not bound to this struggle. You may say, well, this struggle's gone on for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, one year, one month, one day. It doesn't matter. We have an advocate with the Father. And we're, we're free in Him. So let me read the psalm one more time and we'll close. Psalm 139, 23. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me into the way everlasting. So let's think of the key words here. Search. Know. Test. See. Lead. Let's pray. Father, I pray these words now from this Psalm 139 will be a, a way to start thinking that You want to see us walk in the pure freedom You've provided. Not hanging on to besetting sins and just declaring we can do no better, but to realize you have done all there is to be done through Christ. And even if we are sinning, there is an advocate with the Father. And for those who are struggling in those sin, any one of us, we confess the sin to you, Lord. We lift it up even now. We confess. We agree. Whatever you've said about it, we believe that. And Lord, thank you for the restoration of our fellowship with you through that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd invite our band to come back. So instead of a life lived with religious overtones or undertones, a life lived that's basically a person following God. His Word, directed by the Holy Spirit, finding their whole sufficiency in Him and not in this world or their actions. So we would follow Him. Let's sing together this song.
advocate which is Jesus Christ the righteous who sits at the right hand of God Lord as we struggle in this world or sin I pray as we sin Lord we just come back to you and restore fellowship by declaring confessing Lord this isn't what you want you have said this is sin Lord thank you that we can find a restoration through you and salvation through what has been done through Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are.